I would like to thank the organizers for the invitation and for this to this very uh, very nice conference. I enjoyed all the talks so far. Okay. So what I'm going to talk about is water wave. Okay. So basically the question is say if how to understand the wave in the middle of the ocean, right? So you have some waveform at some time you want to understand how does it evolute, what kind of typical behavior it is. Okay. So for the water in the middle of the ocean, we use this basic assumption that the air density is zero, so that means we neglect the wind. Okay. And the water density is one, and the water region is in general below the air region, but of course you can overturn like this. Okay. And we assume that the water is inviscid, incompressible, and rotational. Okay. So inviscid, <laughs> incompressible are reasonable assumptions for the water in the middle of the ocean okay, in this large scale. Your rotational is assumption that we do have rotational waves, rotational fluids, but here we assume it's rotational because we know that if it's the fluid is initially irrotational, it remains irrotational for all time. Okay. And we neglect surface tension because the surface tension is responsible for the ripples. Okay. So we only care about the large wave motion. So we just neglect surface tension and there's a gravity. Okay. So this is a basic equation and we have seen already last week in the lecture of Professor Tataru. Okay, so this is the first equation is Euler equation, the left hand side the acceleration, V is velocity, and the right hand side the force term. So here we assume the density of the fluid is one, so this is like really force equal to the mass density times acceleration. Okay. And divergence zero, coke zero, so incompressible rotational. And because we assume the surface tension zero, so the only and the air density is zero, so the only pressure force from the is from the air is zero on the interface. Okay, so the pressure is zero everywhere on the interface. So now for this type of problem, there's an important sign condition that's called Taylor sign condition, which was discovered by G. I. Taylor around 1949. Okay, so basically it says that the fluid, the pressure has to be increasing in the inward normal direction. Okay, because if it's decreasing, then there's a force rip open the fluid and then the bubble will form. Then, of course, this formulation will not hold anymore, right? Because here we are assuming that the domain initially is, I mean, you have new boundaries form inside the domain. So this is the, so this problem is no longer well set. So this is an important assumption. Okay, so of course water waves, I mean, is a very common phenomena and the study of it can trade back long, long time ago. Okay, so I just give you on the top line some, I mean, great names, Stokes, Levi Cevita and G.I. Taylor. And I just give you a brief review of some branches of water wave. Okay, so here a lot of work exists in the existence of solitary waves and periodic waves starting from maybe even earlier than Levi Civita. No, of course, we have Stokes Le earlier, but we have Levi Civita, Friedrich Hayes, and these people, and actually still more work is produced. For example, the very last person, Miles Wheeler, is now in Kuran. It's, I think, two years out of PhD. Okay? And there's also a lot of numerical works. So this list is by no means complete. Okay? So, and, uh, but these are some important papers. And so what's interesting is this problem, apparently in the 50s, 60s, 70s, there, so these work, either numerical or, I mean, existence of solitary wave, uh, let me mention that actually it's a, still a widely open subject on the stability of solitary wave. Okay, so we have very little known about the stability. We do have this Benjamin Fair instability for the Stokes wave that's uh, modulation instability, and there is a dynamical system approach given by, approved by Tom Bridges and Alexander Milke. And for solitary wave, we, I, I'm only aware of the work of uh, Pago and the Sun on the spectral stability of small solitary waves. Okay. And uh, Zhu Ling has instability of large solitary waves. And of course, there are numerical works to demonstrate the stability and instability. Okay, so, so, but for time dependent problem in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, very little could be done because, so basically more, most work were in analytic class. Okay. And we have, no, we have the work of Kano Nishida 
and of Sannikov. Okay. So the reason that the work was done only in analytic class is for the time-dependent problem is that if you really want to work on the sublift class, you have to understand how to, what is the nature of the quasi-linearization of the equation. Okay. So whether this equation is hyperbolic type or elliptic type, right? Because in analytic class, it doesn't really matter. But you, if you want to build uh, energy that uh, in sublift type energy to close, you have to know what type of quasi-linearization is this. Okay, so the first work in this direction was given by Nalimov okay, for infinite depths to the water wave. And there he assumed interface flat, initial velocity small. So this paper was written in Russian. Now I put an uh, important name here, even though he didn't write a paper on this. But the Nishida was uh, a very good Japanese, great Japanese mathematician, and he was visiting Paris in the late 70s. Okay. So he saw the paper of Nalimov and he could read Russian. So he translated it into English and gave it to his student Yoshihara. Okay. So Yoshihara, if you read the introduction of Yoshihara, he basically says that I follow the approach of, approach of Nalimov. Okay. And what he did is he could prove for finite depths to these small data. Well, post this okay, for a short time. Okay, and then we have seen the work of Walter Craig in 1985, where the main contribution is he got the KDV asymptotics, okay, deriving rigorously from the water wave equation. Okay, so, so now there is another important work is the Tom Beal, Tom Hall, and the Rowan group. So in this work, the importance of terms of Taylor sign condition becomes apparent. Okay, so they basically say that if I just take a solution of the water, suppose we have a solution water wave equation, and if we linearize about this given solution, then the problem is linearly well posed if this condition holds. Okay. So for this, is, this shows the importance of this assumption. So therefore, and we look at this and we just think whether this could be true, and we actually proved it. Okay. In the, the first proof was given in 97, and then I gave another proof. That, uh, in 97, the paper's on 2D, and then 99 was 3D. So the first thing we proved is that the Taylor sign condition always holds for incompressible ir irrotational water wave of infinite depths, okay? as long as the interface is non-self-intersecting and smooth. So actually, in the 97 paper, I gave a precise formula, which is still very important for the work I'm going to present today. And in 97, uh, 99, and in the 3D case, I use the, uh, I, I use maximum principle, okay? It's a more vague type of uh, uh, result, okay? Okay, so now the key, I, key, the important new tool we introduced in this paper was uh, to use Riemann mapping. As explained by the Professor Tataru last week, you know, the Riemann map, so, so there is a Dirichlet Neumann operator in this problem, which is fully nonlinear. It's difficult to understand. In fact, we just by you looking at the work of Ishihara and Nalimov, it's quite apparent, right? The, the derivation of quasi linearization is messy and then only work for small data. So you see, so, and we realize the Riemann mapping just flattened the domain and can simplify considerably the problem, and we can understand the problem much better. So we use the Riemann mapping variable and we derive, so what's important, the, the second important work part of the paper is to derive the quasi-linear equation in the Riemann mapping variable. And we realize that this equation actually is uh, of hyperbolic type. And so, so here I just want to emphasize that, well, in 2D it looks like, okay, you use Riemann mapping, so what about 3D, right? So in 3D there is no Riemann mapping. So the basic idea is you just try to understand as much as possible using as much tools as you pos possible available, right? So for example, we use Riemann mapping and we derive the quasi-linear equation and then we find that actually Riemann mapping is not needed. So in 3D, we actually just write, uh, we find that we can actually just use Lagrangian coordinates. And actually the same proof also work for 2D, okay? So use Lagrangian coordinates, we also can prove local well postness, okay? In sublift class, but this is all for S sufficiently large, okay? Okay, so let me just uh, also mention that, that actually Riemann mapping, as mentioned by 
Professor Tataru is really not a new tool. Okay, so it's, it's, it's commonly used to study potential flow, 2D potential flow. And for example, it was used in the paper of uh, uh, Zakharov, Daichanko, Vashiliev, where a division norm operator actually is absolute value of k. So to, to do the numerics, it becomes much easier, right? So you just calculate the Fourier modes as evolutionary by absolute value of k, and then it's much easier. And here, in the work of Asanikov, he studied, he apparently the equation becomes simpler in his setting, but he still studied in the analytic class. Okay. So he didn't derive the quasi-linear equation there. So in both these previous works, quasi-linear equation was not derived. Okay, so the local well postness has since then has been extended to many more complex settings. For example, you can include non-zero surface tension and finite depths and you can also include non-zero vorticity. So let me just mention that so far, finite depths always the, the height, okay, so the, 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 in the bottom of the fluid and the interface do not interact. Okay, so this is the fluid, okay, and this is bottom. So the minimum height, so the height has a strict lower bound. Okay, so this is the bottom, okay. So in this case, and so these, and, but in all these work, the Taylor sign condition do not hold automatically and you have to assume it. So in the crystal limbra, the uh, energy estimate was obtained by fluids with non-zero vorticity and uh, for example, Am Ambrose Masmoudi gave the approval for non-zero surface tension and the Davi Lang with finite depths, but importantly it's in Euler coordinates and we have more work Okay, so in the general setting. And uh, mo more recently, there's also, we also see compressible fluids with free boundary, right? So we, yesterday, we have just seen the work, uh, the proof of Hans and his student, Chen Yun Luo, okay? Okay, so now, so, so by, f by now, there are also quite a lot of work on global behavior, okay? for small, smooth, and localized data. So here, it's very to, in order to go to global, it's very important to have localized data. So we first, so, so, so in the 2D case, in this work, we were able to show that if the data, size of the data is epsilon, then the solution, and the data is sufficiently smooth and localized, then you can solve the equation for the time e to the one over epsilon, okay? So the main idea in this work is that we find, okay, we find a nonlinear change of coordinates and a nonlinear change of unknown. Okay, so like, like I, as explained by Professor Tataru last week, okay, so I mean, uh, if you perform the Chatar type of normal form change and there was a loss of derivative, okay, so it depends on in which level you're looking at. So if you look at velocity potential and interface as a loss of derivative, but if you look at the velocity and acceleration level of the equation, then there's a small divisor at the origin. So anyway, the Fourier symbol of the transformation is not bounded. So you have to deal with this. So the way we dealt with there is to find a cha nonlinear change of unknown plus a nonlinear change of coordinates. So this, in this new unknown in this new coordinate system actually satisfy equation that contains no quadratic nonlinearity. Okay, so the quadratic nonlinearity can completely remove. And that's why we can, and using the dispersion relation in 2D, we can prove almost global. And for this global 3D paper, we use a similar idea. So this idea, so as I said earlier, always this is our strategy is we try to understand the 2D case as well as enough, and then we hope that we can extend it to 3D. Okay, so German Masmoudi Shata gave a different approach independently for the global existence, and they also get scattering okay, for the 3D case. So what they, the method they use is the so-called, they call it space-time resonance method. Okay. And now the 2D work has been extended independent by Ionescu, Pesateri, and Alazar Dolo, and to, to global, okay, and where they also showed, both showed modified scattering but all of them are small, smooth, and localized data. And last week, we have just seen another proof by Daniel Tataru using modified energy, okay. And we also, so now there, so I, I don't think this is, I can just make a complete list and just mention a few, okay. So this is, Xuesen Wang is a student of uh, UNESCO and wrote a paper on 3D water wave with global and smooth, 
small, smooth, localized data and with flat bottom. And uh, we also seen the lecture of Daniel last week and for flat bottom in the 2D case. So for, for cubic lifespan. So essentially I would, so see, even though this work is not global, but I would group them together because the essential idea is the same that the quadratic nonlinearity can be removed one way or, or the other. Okay. So now I mentioned this very important new work. Then, then UNESCO, Pasateri, and uh, Poseidon. Okay, they look different. Is it very? Okay, it's okay. It's okay. Yeah, I think uh, the order is correct. <laughs> L is before S, right? Hmm? Okay, so this is for 3D gravity capillary waterway. So, so apparently with both gravity and capillary, the resonance set is no longer just one, set, one point. It's really a circle, okay? But they can actually still handle it and got global existence for localized smooth data, small smooth data. So, so here I also mentioned our recent work with uh, Lydia Bieri, Shuang Miao, and uh, Saurabh Shashani, where we studied self-gravitating fluids. Okay, so, f so here the, the main difference is the gravity is no longer a constant. The gravity is a, a nonlinear one, which is a self-gravitating one. And uh, still we, are, we can find a change of unknown and a change of coordinate system so that the uh, quadratic nonlinearity is just removed. Okay, there's no quadratic nonlinearity in this new unknown, for well, this new unknown and in this new coordinate system. Okay, okay so, so, so there are also efforts in other directions such as try to prove well this in low regularity class. Okay, so the reason is of course if you assume less on the, on the, on the data and on the solution maybe you are able to get the scaling level and then you could prove global existence. Okay, so what was achieved by Alazar Burke Suri is that they are able to prove local well postness in sublift spaces and the regularity is equivalent to the to requiring the interface is C3 half plus a little bit and then they use strict house estimate to lower the regularity just C3 half minus a little bit so more or less it's C3 half and last week we have seen the presentation of Daniel on log in the 2D case okay so in a similar class I would say okay somewhere in between as explained by Daniel Okay, so let me also mention there was also work of uh, the uh, cordoba Pfefferman group on uh, so-called splash singularity. So splash singularity is basically says uh, it is possible to have a non-self-intersecting non interface, it becomes self-intersecting at certain later times. So there exists, there exists something like this and becomes at later time become self-intersecting. So the basic idea is you just start with something like this and you find the velocity field to put open and then you use a time reversibility and to prove there is one to go from here to there. Okay. 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 So and um, the 3D is given by Corten Scholar. So since I'm mentioning this, so maybe I'm not going to mention later. So in fact, so Remember, I, I mentioned that we derived the quasi-linear equation for the water wave equation, right, in the Riemann mapping variable. In fact, if you look at the quasi-linear equation, this is the quasi-linear equation about, acceleration, about the velocity and acceleration. So you don't see the interface anymore. So in fact, this quasi-linear e equation applies to self-intersecting interface as well. As long as you have a conformal mapping, <coughs> takes the lower half plane to to, to a fluid, for example, this is a Riemann surface. If you can, you can just regard it as a Riemann surface. Suppose you have a conformal mapping to take it to there, and the quasi-linearized equation holds. Of course, here you are cheating in this case, right? Because in the real fluid, when the fluid intersects in like this situation, the pressure is not zero here, okay? But of course, you pretend your pressure is just continues to be zero, then the uh, that's, that's not physical, okay. but theoretically the quasi-linear equation actually do not rule out self-intersecting wave. But in order to show that, uh, so the, you, when you solve the self-intersecting, uh, solve the self-similar solution, you actually don't know whether your interface is self-intersecting or not because you are solving an equation about velocity and acceleration. But when you try to recover the solution of the water wave equation you have to cut off at the time when 
it becomes self-intersecting because after that it's no longer physical. Okay. Okay. So the the, re so, so the, the real contribution of the Pfefferman and the Cordoba group is to find a velocity to field. It's really they show there is a velocity field to pull it open. But actually, their approach they didn't use my quasi-linear equation. Okay, so let me just they actually just did the whole thing from scratch. Okay, okay, so 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 this is uh, the picture I we really want to understand today. Okay, so. So if you look at this, this is not, it's really, it really seems to be quite singular, right? So of course it's like, it's probably not even C1. It looks like there's a kink on it. So how do we understand this picture? Okay. So if we look at this, well, the first approach we want to say is, I mean, where do we start, right? So we try to say, maybe this thing is self-similar at the, you know, at the kink, okay? At the kink, it could be self-similar. So let's see whether we can, I mean, because this is a very important method in PDE just to find self-similar solution, okay? So in other, so the basic question is what type of singular behavior we find in water wave and where does it come from with are some basic structure, okay? So the first thing we want to find is, are there any self-similar solutions? Okay, so now in order to find self-similar solution, we have to understand what kind of scaling is important here. Okay, so if we look at this wave, we think that, well, if you look, if you really look at the wave, you see this thing happens, the kink happens is due to the motion. Okay, so this means that the convection should be important, or this should be driven by convection or the velocity. So this means we need to use a hyperbolic scale. Okay, so the so spatial variable is scale like time variable. Okay, so in other words, you try to plug in, uh, your answers look like t to some alpha f of uh, z over t, something like this. Okay, and if you try to, if you use this answers, you have to ignite uh, gravity, right? Because the gravity scales differently. Okay, time is scale is x over t square, right? So it's like gravity is scaled different from. So you, we neglect gravity and surface tension. Surface tension also has a different scaling. But still, we need to assume Taylor sign condition hold, right? Because we know Taylor sign condition is a stability condition. So in order to see the wave, this has to be true. Otherwise, we won't see the wave. OK, so what we realize, first thing is just by plugging the answers is that, well, if there is such a wave, the wave have to look like this, concave up on one side. And it's possible to turn a degree and then concave up again. Okay. The concave up, concavity is due to the requirement negative dpd and is non-negative. Okay, so this is really like the, if you write down it, it's very clear that, you know, the concavity is secondarily positive. Okay, and another, another thing is that if such thing exists, this angle has to be less than pi over 2 and this wide angle at infinity is bigger than pi over 2. Okay, so this is in order for the wave to not roll up infinite many times. Okay. Okay, so the question is, well, is this anything real, like anything real like this, concave up on both sides, right? <laughs> we, it's kind of, because I'm not so sure, actually I was not so sure at that time because I don't really see waves that much in Ann Arbor. <laughs> okay, we have a river, we don't have ocean. Okay, so, so anyway, what we could find is something concave up on both sides. So now I'm going to show you some photo I took. This is in San Diego. And to convince you what we found actually is not far away from reality, it seems. Okay. So this is, I was standing here and looking at the wave underneath. Okay. So you see the waves coming in and then reflect out. Okay. So the wave reflect out like this and then some wave train forms. The next thing is they creak up, right? Crest up and break. Okay. So if we look at the crest, look like it's concave up on both sides. So it's so because of we saw this photo. <laughs> actually, not we saw this photo. Because I saw this, I went to actually <laughs> find the solution because I knew the answers for a while, but, but I was not convinced enough that this is anything meaningful to find such a thing. Okay. So, okay. So <laughs> now, and we also see this. Uh, this is a photo I took from internet. Okay. So concave up on both sides. And now, once you see, and uh, once you, you realize things are concave up, actually you see it e almost everywhere. Okay, so this is on the you know the river here, in Paris. I was standing on the bridge, and then this boat going forward, and then the wave behind it. Okay, 
So this, so you can basically say, think that you know the way the, the the fluid is pushed out and outside the velocity is zero. So there's a relative motion of the velocity, and then the things look like concave up. Okay, so it looks like we could be happy now. Okay, and this is concave up also. <laughs> so, so but the but of course we. It doesn't really, really mean a lot, these photos, because in real situation, there are many factors in, uh, in it. And in, the, in the, fruit, the equation we are thinking, that we assume there's no wind, no surface tension. I mean, it's quite idealized. So still, this is a question to be answered. What, how relevant is a self-similar solution? We really want to understand the relevance of this. Okay, okay so I'm going to change the topic for, for now. Just forget about self-similar. So we are going to go back to self-similar later. So for the moment, so for the moment, so I just want to change topic. So remember that so far the, we, what has been studied is there's no interaction of the fixed boundary and the fluid. And also all the situation required there's a really a strict lower bound of the negative DPDN has a positive lower bound. Okay. okay, so very common, of course, we really want to understand how does the interface interact with a fixed boundary. Okay, so even if, of course, if in the real situation, if it's a sand, it's very difficult to model. But even if we assume this is a smooth, rigid boundary, it's not easy to, to understand. Okay, okay so what's the, how does the in, uh, interface interact with a fixed boundary? Okay, so of course, on a rigid, smooth boundary, that's what you would have to assume, v dot n equal to zero. That means the free particle only slight along the interface. Okay, so this is a difficult to, uh, situation to understand. But, okay, so, but there's one particular situation, it seems that, and this is the equation that you want to write down. Okay, so the same equation and plus this boundary condition. Okay, so there is a particular simple situation that we can understand. So this is like, just imagine you have a cup. Okay, if you have a cup, and you have just a vertical boundary, okay? You have a vertical boundary, and then you shake the fluid in the cup, right? So you sh shake your cup, and then you see how the fluid interact with the There's no fluid here. <laughs> Very little fluid, don't worry. <laughs> so, so how does this interact, right? So, so why this is easy? Because, you know, so if you have fluid going up like this, so you think about this fluid going up and like this, but roughly you can also think you know, this is, if you just symmetrize, symmet do a symmetric reflection, it's same, it's, it's equivalent to this problem, right? So you reflect the fluid, okay. And you can just remove the solid boundary, right? So these two problems are purely equivalent. So if you have something symmetric, and the free particle has to go only up and down along the interface, right? So this satisfies automatically the boundary condition. Okay, so I thought this is a quite easy problem. <laughs> so I gave it to my student, okay, Rafe Kinsey, because I thought, and I waited, actually. I thought about it, and I thought, oh, that's a good problem for a student. So I waited till a st for a student to arrive, and then gave it to him. So why don't you study this, okay? So there are two situations here, okay? So one situation is you make an angle like this. Another situation is you make an angle just a 90 degree angle, right? So if you reflect by 90 degree and you remove, and you can see that the problem is reduced to something like smooth, okay? So in fact, this situation has been studied by Alazar Burks really in their paper. So in fact, they also, they really just did the reflection and reduced in the 90 degrees case and basically, they reduce to a smooth case, okay, so the whole domain. So boundary or no boundary, it's by refraction to remove the boundary. And they studied in, C, in the C3 half setting, okay. So I told Rafe that, well, we have to avoid the 90 degree situation, right, because it's difficult to tell people why you're new, okay. Anything you get is anything new. So we want to understand whether it's possible to form an angle which is not 90. So that's the main question. So whether this can be not 90? Okay, so is the question is, is it possible for the interface to interact with a wall with a non-90 degree? Okay. 
okay, so to put the problem easier, I just told Rafe that, okay, well, why don't you just, you know, assume there's only one angle. So you have a cup, okay, you have two sides, you can reflect on both sides. Let's assume that on one side is just a 90 degree angle and on the other side is a not 90. So just try to understand what type of angle can this be. Let's assume this is 90. So you reflect, so this is a graph, reflect on this side and then removes the singularity here, right? There's no, no singularity, so there's only one angle you have to understand. So it turns out that, so the question is whether this angle can be other than 90 and we want to understand in the frame, is a, is a, answer the question in terms of getting a proteasmate and local existence. Okay. So it turns out just by un trying to understand whether it's possible to have one non-90 an angle and we can actually treat very general situation. Okay. So what we can answer is uh, quite, quite general, quite general. The answer is yes, it, is, it can be not 90, okay. So in fact, we can treat arbitrary situations, right? It's not just one angle here, it can be many angles inside the free domain, okay. So this angle can be many, okay. And we also don't have to treat uh, uh, a fi two fixed boundary here. So you can have, so either you have a fixed boundary and this can, you can have as many as an angle as, as you want, okay, or you can just treat a better wave like this, okay. So if there is an angle, okay, this angle is if there is an angle, this, this angle with this vertical boundary has to be, mu has less to be less than 90 degree, okay. If there is, it does form angle which is not 90, then it has to be less than 90. In other words, it is not possible to have an angle like this, okay. So this angle is not possible. Such a situation is not possible. And of course, we can also have angles in the interior, right? So for the interior angle, this angle has to be no more than 180. Okay. So in other words, you, we don't see water wave like this. Okay. So of course, I mean, that's quite obvious, right? Every kid knows if you ask them to draw, you will never draw <laughs> a graph like this, okay? Okay, so, so, so everybody knows this. And actually this, this fact is purely just determined by the water wave equation. Okay, so I will explain why. Okay, so in fact, this is really just by purely under, coming from the quasi-linear equation we derived in the 97, you, you can understand these simple facts, okay. Okay, so now what we did, yeah, what we have, uh, so the main result is the following. So we are able to construct an analytic framework this framework is more general than just Sobolev class, okay? So include all the Sobolev class, it, I mean, this for S big enough, like so less than three, okay? So for less than two, maybe, okay? And we, but this framework can also in, include interface with angle crest, okay? So now this interface, so if, so, and we obtain a probability estimate and we obtain the local existence in this region, which include Sobolev and include angle crest. And uh, what I want to really say is that this, by now we can say that by understanding this is more fitting framework to study water wave equation. So in other words, previously we had studied, uh, we used Sobolev class. You know, when we did it, we always feel there was something not completely fit. Okay, so here it seems that this is quite fit. Okay, so I, I have a uh, feeling that this, we got, we finally got things right now. Okay, but of course things can still be better. Okay, okay so the appropriate estimate was done jointly with Rafe Kingsley, my student. Okay, so in other words, okay, just explanation. Okay, so such a picture is possible. Okay, so 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 now so this so how do we understand this? Okay, so I guess in this community nobody questions. So, so in fact, I gave this lecture in many other community, and they say, well, uh, I mean what you do is really just not right because you know, in order for wave like this to form, you need wind, okay. Chinese, there was Chinese phrase says, no wind, no wave. Okay. <laughs> 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 so how come you have this, right? But the a basic fact about wave is that, you know, we know that a storm can form in very far 
place. Okay, and the, once it's formed, then the wave is formulated, formed waveforms. But this wave can travel for a long distance. So the wave in front of you could be coming from far away. It doesn't have to come from the wind right above it. Okay, so this could still be a situation that under a vacuum. Okay, this is not caused by the wind right blowing above it. It can be a wind blow like far, far away. Okay, and this is a wave travel. So in other words, once it forms, it stays like this and we're not, okay. So this is possible. Okay, so the main difficulty to study wave with singularity, angle crest, is that actually, so we can still prove negative dp, the end positive, non-negative. So in fact, this, this fact has already been proved in 97. Okay, so if you look at the formula, you do have lower bound greater than or equal to zero. Okay, but the negative dp, the end equal to zero at the wall where there is a non-90 degree. Okay, so if you form an angle like this, negative dp, the end equals to zero, and the negative dp dn equal to zero in all the angle crest. So negative dp dn equals to zero where there's a singularity, angled crest. Okay, so, so the main difficulty is if you allow angle crest in, the, in, 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 your, in your wave, then negative dp dn becomes zero in these in singularities. Okay, so why this is the case? Okay, so let's just derive uh, briefly. Actually, I'm going to derive briefly the quasi-linear equation because it can be done pretty easily. Okay, so, so, so this is the interface in Lagrangian coordinates. So you, we write down the, in Lagrangian coordinates, so taking derivative to t, you get velocity, to derivative t, you get acceleration. And we normalize the gravity equal to one, so minus i is a gravity. And the pressure zero equal to zero on the interface means that gradient p is pointing in the normal direction of the interface. So we write down negative gradient p is because z alpha, z alpha is a tangential vector, okay, z alpha, and i z alpha is the normal vector. Okay, so a is just a real value quantity and precisely it's given by minus the, the Jacobian times dpdn. Okay, so it has the same sign as negative dpdn. Okay, so then we can write down the Euler equation, right? So the Euler equation is acceleration equal to gra gravity on the right-hand side. So this is acceleration minus gravity equal to gradient p. Okay, so this is negative gradient p, okay? And now divergence co equal to zero means that the velocity field bar is a holomorphic function, okay? Being holomorphic, you can write it in terms of the Hilbert transform. Okay, so this is a direct consequence of the Cauchy integral formula. And here I will show you the, diffi real, the difficulty of not using Riemann mapping. Okay, so you can see that. Oh, I, I'm going to show you the difficulties here. Okay, but so, the, so this Hilbert transform actually is written like this. Okay, so difficulty is you have the unknown in the denominator. It's really just too nonlinear to understand this. Okay, so that's why we use Riemann mapping in the first paper. Okay, just to understand this. But this quasi-linear de derivation actually was the one version of 99. So this is after we understand it in the 2D case in 97 using Riemann mapping. Okay, so here, this derivation actually is in Lagrangian coordinates. So briefly speaking is, just by taking one time, we realize, okay, so of course, I mean, this is a normal pr procedure of taking uh, quasi-linearization is just, you just take derivatives to the equation, right? You get, but the question is, which equation you take derivative? Do you take time derivative, a space derivative, or which one, okay? So it turns out that we only need to take one time derivative of the first equation, okay? And then, so this has become two terms, right? So one of the terms is higher order and one's lower order. So we just move one of the terms to the left. So the left-hand side is higher order term, the right-hand side is lower order term. And the reason is this quantity A is real value and you use the projection I minus H to project and you get a lot of commutative. I don't go too into detail. So, so the left-hand side shows clearly the Taylor sign. Where is it? it is, okay. So U is ZT bar. So if ZT bar is uh, holomorphic, then I d alpha of a holomorphic function, I d alpha of a holomorphic function actually is really the normal derivative, Dirichlet-Neumann operator acting on the normal derivative, OK? 
Okay, so this is a Dirichlet Neumann operator. So this is how it goes about. So the left-hand side, the main operator of the water wave equation is like this. And we know the Dirichlet Neumann operator is a positive operator, right? And this A is the, the negative dpdn times this. So this clearly shows that if negative dpdn has a strict lower bound as this is hyperbolic type, right? If negative dpdn is negative, it's elliptic type and it's ill post. So because we have shown negative dpdn has a strictly lower bound in the smooth case, so the problem is hyperbolic type and we were able to prove the energy estimate. So now the question is, the situation we are facing is negative dpdn actually equal to zero sometimes. So if it's equal to zero, then we are in trouble, right? So the lower order term on the right may not be lower order anymore, okay? So the type of the equation could change, okay? So that's the difficulty, okay? So Okay, so I already explained that we really knew, need to use Riemann mapping. So, so this was actually still the derivation of 97. So we actually use the Riemann mapping. The reason of using Riemann mapping is here. Okay, so we just rewrite everything in terms of Riemann mapping variable. Okay, so it takes the Riemann mapping from, from the free domain to the lower half plane. Okay, and now we just rewrite everything in terms of Riemann mapping variable. So compose it with, with H inverse acceleration compose. So capital. The sign, capital sign, means it's in the Riemann mapping variable, okay? So everything is the same, right? So this quantity, capital A, is just, we have this Jacobian that's come from chain root, right? So the first equation basically is of the same type, except in the, you just do the chain root, okay, here. And what's really make a difference is the second equation. So the velocity field, okay? Now, velocity field, so the velocity field after composed with the Riemann mapping becomes a holomorphic function in the lower half plane, uh, which has a boundary value as c t bar. Okay. So to ca ca characterize a holomorphic function in the lower half a plane, then we only need to use this flat Hilbert transform, which is much more simpler and it's linear. Okay. So, so just using this, so let me just keep the notation that, okay. So capital Z is phi inverse and Z bar is this, okay? So now we two, two, this was still the early work. In order to show the Taylor sum condition pose, we actually just multiply the equation to both sides by Z alpha bar, and we get A1 and we derive a formula for A1 and we show that A1 actually have a lower bound. So this is a precise formula. And this formula just implies negative dpdn is non-negative, right? Because we can write down negative dpdn is A1 divided by this is greater than or equal to zero. Okay, so A1, this quantity A1 has a lower bound, which is one, okay, that's very important. So, okay, so if the interface is smooth, then the, this is a Jacobian of the Riemann mapping, right? The Jacobian of Riemann mapping have upper and lower bound. So obviously it has a strictly positive lower bound. And that was the case dealt with in 97. So now you have, uh, this guy is actually has singularity, so that means this bound may not hold, okay. I think I, did I skip some transparency? Is that, anyway, that's okay. I, have, I thought I have a simple argument. Oh, I skipped it, okay. Anyway, <laughs> I, 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 I don't know. That's okay, actually I don't have time now, right? So, so, so okay. So this is a quasi-linear equation. This is, I just give you an idea how it looks. Okay, so let me just, so since, I mean, we, you have seen the lecture of Daniel last week, and it looked quite different from his. Actually, this is, the difference, main difference is really the notation. So, so if you, I mean, it, this equation very, uh, his equation or this equation, I mean, overlap in a large extent. Same equations. But the same derivative has a very different meaning in your notation as in our notation. Okay, so yeah, so this B, particularly this B is the same B. Okay, so, so, so I mean, that's not surprising, right? It's just really a matter of how to use this equation. I mean, we use, we have, I mean, because we're dealing with the same equation, and uh, of course we have, uh, and we use the same variable if we get, different equations then, I mean, it, it's scary for the young people, okay? <laughs> if uh, if equations different in 
that, that would be pretty bad. Okay, so this is a very important equation as a consequence of this derivation. Okay, so ZTT plus I, Z alpha bar is I A1. So we just use it as like you just divide over. Okay, so this is the same equation as this one. Okay, so that's the same equation. Okay, so A1 has a lower bound greater than or equal to 1. So in other words, 1 over Z alpha is similar to ZTT minus I because A1 is a low order term. Ah, this is a transparency. So, so here I give you an argument which is very early on given by my student, Ray Kinsey, my former student. Okay, so, so he said very quickly that negative dp dn equal to zero, we are in trouble. Okay, so why negative dp dn equals to zero? So this equation, the, the, the Euler equation, you, if you write down in terms of components, you can rearrange like this. And tangent of mu, okay, so this new is this angle, okay, this angle, this angle nu. So of course, this is your tangent vector x alpha, y alpha, right? Tangent nu is given by this. So now we know that fluid particle only move up and down, okay? So xt equals to zero, okay? So of course, xtt is also equal to zero along this line, okay? So this means the denominator is always zero. Now, in order for mu to be not equal to 90, then ytt plus one has to be zero, right? Because otherwise, mu is pi over two. Okay, so this means that gradient p has to be zero because now ztt plus i is zero. So gradient p has to be zero. So gradient p has to be zero, that means n dot gradient p equals zero. So in other words, a is zero at the corner. Remember, a is, a, a is like one over z alpha times n dot gradient p. So this is like n dot gradient p equals zero, okay. Okay, so this is a very simple argument. Now why, so I give you a, also a derivation why this angle has to be less than pi over two. So the reason it is less than pi over two is the following. So you just look at the Riemann mapping, okay. So it's very simple. You look at the Riemann mapping. Can I borrow a few minutes? I will only need five minutes, five minutes. Too much? I started late. <laughs> I started late. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, 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 so if you look at the Riemann mapping, okay, so this is like, you know, this is, uh, so this is your, the, the, the angle mu, right? This is phi, okay. So you take Riemann mapping from here to here. So in order to take the angle mu to pi over two, you need at this point a power law to open up. Okay, so this is a power law. It says that, okay, it's given by this relation. So if you take derivative, the Riemann mapping z alpha prime is like alpha prime r minus one. So if this angle is bigger than pi over two, then th this r has to be bigger than one. That means the alpha has to be zero at the corner. And z alpha has to be zero at the corner means z tt has to be infinity, right? If you look at this formula, because a one is greater than or equal to one. Okay, so z tt is infinity. So this means ytt has to be infinity at the corner because xtt we already know is zero, right? Because xtt is zero along this line, okay? Okay, so, but remember that was the formula for the tangent of the angle. So this means that tangent of mu has to be infinity, right? Because the denominator is zero, at the top is infinity. So at the end, if, if you start with anything bigger than pi over two, it has to be pi over two, okay? So you, you cannot have anything bigger than pi over two. So this is purely determined by this relation, which is the Euler equation, okay. Okay, so let me just show you how we construct energy function, okay. So we use this weighted derivative, okay. So still we use this so-called quasi-linear equation, even though in this case it's not <coughs> very clear, it's still hyperbolic type, but and even, okay, because A could be zero somewhere. But we still use it, and we use a weighted derivative, okay. And now, of course, th there is an obvious energy coming from the left-hand side. I mean, this is elementary, but this doesn't work because this, on this becomes infinity if you want to deal with anything singular. Okay, so what ends up is we use this weighted, uh, these two weighted energy, okay? And you take two deriv one derivative to apply to this one, two derivative apply to this one. So it's difficult to see from here. So let me just explain what are we doing in this energy. So this energy, is equivalent to this one, okay? So this is the quantity. So basic quantity is uh, the acceleration on the surface taking derivatives in L2, okay? So now if you want to take further derivatives, 
you have to put appropriate weights. Okay, so what is capital D alpha? A capital D alpha is one over Z alpha, D alpha. Okay, so now two derivatives, one over Z alpha. Okay, and Z T alpha. So now this guy is basically in L two. Now if you want one more derivative to be in L2 because if it's singular, you take derivative become more singular. But remember that in the, in the angle crest, crest, precisely 1 over z alpha is 0, right? So if there's a singularity, one over the weight is 0, okay? So this means in order to, to uh, for the derivative to be in L2, you have to t put two weights to weight it down. So 2, 0 to weight it down, and this is still in L2. So overall, so overall, you get this uh, energy, okay? So this weighted energy. And uh, I just want to emphasize everything here has a derivative. So in other words, we don't really require, uh, the surface itself is in L2, okay? So it's like, you know, you, the behavior at infinity can be wired, okay? The, ex the velocity at infinity could be wired, only the derivative is in L2, okay? Everything has a derivative. So things can be quite big at infinity here. Okay, so I don't see the uh, talk about difficulty. So why is this energy works? Okay, so, so anyway, this energy works, but w w what makes us believe this works? Because you know, the real derivation is long, right? You have to really have a confidence, otherwise you won't be able to continue. So the real reason is really, I just go back. Okay, the self-similar solution, I plug in the self-similar solution, I find it's finite. So I say it must work because it, took us a while to find the right energy, okay? What's the right weight? The cell similar. And I also want to emphasize that when, when I say this energy allows angle crest, this angle, interior angle, in fact, cannot be all the way about uh, less than 180. In the energy, this angle has to be less than 90 degrees, same as the self-similar solution. Okay, so in other words, the Stokes wave of maximum height do not have finite energy because the Stokes wave's interior angle is 120 degree. Okay, so what we proved is first we have a poly estimate and then we have the local existence in this framework. So assuming the data satisfy this new energy is finite, then there is a time depend only on the, this new energy so that you can solve for this finite time and this energy remains finite. So let me just remark that Actually, so this was observed first by Rafe Kingsley using a heuristic argument, and Si Tang gave my current student here, he's here, Si Tang, gave a rigorous proof. They showed that if initially you have an interface like this, piecewise smooth, and contains some angle, if initially you have something like this, then the angle actually do not change for the time period the solution exists. Okay, okay so so in order to, to prove the existence, we use approximation argument using the previous result, okay? But this is a crucial, this is a crucial criteria we need because when we use the previous results, all the existence time depend on the Sobolev norm, okay? So we need a time do not depend on Sobolev norm, but only depend on this new energy. So this theorem says that for any given smooth data, okay, you can solve for a finite time. And now if we let t star to be the maximum existent time, then either it's infinity, then we are all happy, or if it's finite, then the interface, this, this energy has to blow up. Okay, so when the singularity, if the singularity happens at a finite time, then this energy has, so this gives us a blow up criteria, or in other words, a criteria to find some singularities. Okay, so I, thank you very much. So one comment on the difference of, of notations, uh -huh. uh, just to clarify things. Okay. So the meaning of the time derivative in the notations that you are using and the time mm -hmm. derivative in the notations that you are using are different. In the notations that you're using, the time derivative is the Lagrangian derivative. That's so true. So it does not commute with the D alpha derivative. That's true. Whereas in the notations that we're using, the time derivative and the alpha derivative are in the same frame, so that they commute. Yeah. Uh, and my question, uh, so... No, actually, we use the same notation because why? Because actually, I, because I go too fast. Okay, <laughs> went too fast. Let me just answer. 
you see, this is a, this is a quasi-linear equation. So this, this, this is really the Lagrangian, this is a Lagrangian uh, material derivative. So you, do, you also have dt plus b d alpha. Right? Yeah. So, so you have, you have uh, two first order equation and we have two, one second order equation. So in other words, it's really that you are, so, so I checked because I go back okay, after your lecture. I checked that your w is essentially z alpha minus one and your r is z t bar. Okay. So these are the two, 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 two quantities, your evolution. And if you, if you like, you can say that we are using, so this is Daniel Tataru and if, uh, Mihaila <laughs> Ifrin. And what we are using is our, you can say, because it's second order ZT and ZTT, okay, ZTT, right. So this capital ZTT is DT plus B D alpha ZT bar, okay. So why I'm saying that these two, uh, to a large extent, is equivalent, so again, I use, we go back to this magic formula here. One over Z alpha is, in, in terms of regularities, like ZTT bar. So you see, there no. Uh, of course, I mean we cannot do different things, right? Because otherwise, no, no. one of us has okay. to be wrong. <laughs> Let me ask a question. So, 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 uh, so the question is the following: So, in this uh, solutions that you obtain, yeah. um, uh, do you obtain solutions at all possible angles uh, less than one hundred and eighty degrees? No, no, no. That's a very good question. We so so in here, the energy only allowed here is less than ninety degrees. It has. So this is consistent with uh, self-similar solution. Yes, but uh, I have yeah. a question. I think, can you obtain any of this, uh, this angle for self-similar solution? Uh, yes. Yeah. For self-similar, yes. Yeah. No, 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 no. For the actual evolution. Can you have solutions which evolve at any possible angle less than 180 degree in this approach? Uh, no, I, st I say that uh, the, the energy only allowed this angle okay. to be less than 90. The end, so, so the statement, okay, let me show you the statement. So, so, so somehow you, take, you can take initial data that has many of these angles if they are less than 90, then you can solve for small time. That's true. No, no, of course, so, the, the, so in fact, uh, let me clarify. Okay. So of course, if you have data smooth, you can solve. No, no problem. That fits in the previous work. Okay. So what's new is you can also take data like this, but not arbitrary. Okay. So you need this be finite, okay? So this, in order for this finite, it allows interface with angle less than 90, okay? So you, you allow this, not every in interface with less than 90 satisfy this finite, but the opposite, okay? So their interface with less than 90 degree satisfy this energy to being finite, and then you can solve for finite time. And as shown by C. Tom that actually, this angle do not change during the time the solution exists. Uh, uh, maybe, uh, no, uh, okay, I have one question, in fact. <laughs> you are passing time. But my, my question, uh, just uh, yes or no. Is okay, okay, <laughs> okay, okay, I'm counting seconds. Uh, <laughs> uh, okay, you say your self-similar solution was in the energy space. No, 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 uh, no, no, okay, no, so no. Okay, no, 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 Okay. Oh, 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 yeah, 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 no, oh, yeah, yes, yes, oh, good, uh, good question. No, I, I, which, which energy? Yes, the answer is yes, yes. That's a good question, okay. No, no, if you plug in the self-similar solution here, the energy is finite. Yes, but not this energy. This energy. Hamiltonian. Hamiltonian, no. No, the, everything has, because we, in fact, here I emphasize that we do not require Z alpha in L infinity. So this is, uh, so this is equivalent to negative DPD and has a lower bound positive. Yeah, no, and we also do not require one over Z alpha in L infinity. Yeah, okay. wait, wait. So we only require one point to be in <laughs> bounded. Yeah, yeah, question, yeah. No, no, but private question. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> 